Hi, welcome. My name is Martha Nowak. I'm K-12 Engagement Coordinator here at K-State Olathe. Well, glad you came today. Today we have Dr. Kara Burke from the K-State Clinic, that clinic. Yep. Okay, and you've been there since June. Yep, I just started in June. So we got a newbie here. <laughs> Um, and she will, she loves questions, so if you've got some and maybe she's kind of going on a roll in a certain section, just write down your question, we can get back to them later. We're also being joined by Blue Valley Caps. Um, they're joining us remotely by Zoom, so if you've ever done a Zoom meeting or a Skype or a FaceTime, that's what they're doing with us. Um, and so they will and I have questions at the end of the uh, presentation also. So I welcome Dr. Kara Burke. Assistant Clinical Professor at the K-State Clinic. So I will turn it over to you. Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing today? Good. Good. Thanks for having me. Um, so I am, like Martha said, I'm a new veterinarian at Kansas State Vet Health Center. Um, and I just came here in June. I am one of the new surgeons in the clinic. And so most of the time that I spend there is actually in the clinic, um, teaching student, veterinary students, um, teaching interns and residents, but also seeing cases that are in the clinic there. Um, so I'm going to start out with kind of a little bit of an overview as to what a veterinarian is, kinds of things that you can do as a veterinarian, maybe why you should consider surgery as a potential career. And then um, go into some interesting cases that I've seen and um, allow you guys to, to see some of those cases. If you have any questions, please feel free to speak up. Um, also, the pictures are from surgery, so they can be a little bit gruesome. So if you're squeamish at all, just avert your eyes, and I can tell you when it's kind of fun. <laughs> All right, um, so veterinarians have a much bigger role than the typical of what you normally think of treating dogs and cats. Um, they are in private practice, that's definitely one of their roles, um, but we're also in teaching and research, we're in industry, we do regulatory medicine and public health. Um, the uniform services are, have a, a veterinary division, and like I said, we're in the industry, so um, there's all different things that you can do with the career. It, you don't have to necessarily be treating dogs and cats if that's not what interests you, um, but kind of leaves the world open for lots of different things. So um, it's not a, a tunnel, tunnel vision. Um, so a surgeon has advanced training past veterinary school. Um, we have gone to veterinary school, then we need to do an internship, plus or minus a specialty internship, which would be in surgery, and then a residency. Residency is usually three years, and there are requirements set forth by the American College of Veterinary Surgeons, and so they include um, a certain number of in different types of cases that we have to participate in, um, presentations to different groups, and published research, and then we have to sit for two board exams that we have to sit and pass successfully. Um, so how do you get there? Um, you can start as early as high school or even before. And you want to make sure that with your math, science, and English classes, you're doing well and paying attention. Um, those are a really important foundation. Um, most people think, when they think of veterinary medicine, that it's basically science. Um, and that's true, but you also need to be able to communicate with people. And um, there's a lot of people skills that you have to have as well as a veterinarian, which a lot of people don't necessarily think about. So um, written communication and verbal communication is important too. So your English classes are also important. And then anything veterinary experience wise you can be involved in. Um, and it doesn't even have to be necessarily with a veterinarian, but 
Um, like Brandon works in a shelter. Um, you could be involved in a club like 4-H or something like that. Anything that kind of gets you a leadership team role, um, gets you out in the community and stuff like that is good. When you get to undergrad, you have to do certain prerequisites for vet school, and all of the vet schools in the, the country will list the different prereqs that they require. And so you don't have to necessarily be a pre-veterinary major. I was an animal science major, and I had a minor in life sciences and a minor in psychology. And so there's lots of different ways that you can get from point A to point B and complete that road. Um, and your varied experiences kind of bring the whole, whole community of veterinarians together, which is really interesting. Um, and then continuing working on your veterinary experiences. And in undergrad, you need to be a little bit more focused to veterinary work. Um, so they look for varied experiences when you're applying to vet school um, that include working with different types of veterinarians. So whether it's private practice or industry or um, some of the large animal veterinarians that are riding around, anything that you can do to um, be a part of that is great. Um, then you get into veterinary school and go through four years of veterinary school. After veterinary school, you would go into an internship and then residency to become a surgeon. And um, why do we want to be, a, why would you want to be a surgeon? Um, number one, it's it's great. It's a rewarding career. Um, so you get to work with adorable animals. You get to help people that are in need and are worried about their family members because, as we know, pets quickly become part of our family. Um, there are several different options for veterinary surgeons. Um, you can, like I said, work in private practice or you can be a, an ophthalmologist. So an, eye doctor and do surgery there. You can be a large animal vet and do surgery out in the field. Um, there's a variety of caseload and this picture is pretty gruesome just to warn you. Um, so this was a dog that came in and had a lot of, a lot of wounds. He was hit by a car. Um, so wounds here, wounds here, um, all down his legs. And so you might see that one day, you might see a normal, happy, healthy puppy that has a broken leg the next. You might see a silly lab that ate a tennis ball the next day. So um, see definitely a, a variety of things, which is keeps things interesting. It's hands-on technical work. So you're working with your hands, you're doing stuff that um, requires, you know, fine motor skills and stuff like that, which works for some people. An expression of creativity. So this was a dog that had a large burn across its back. Um, and so when we're presented with this, we're thinking, how are we going to get that closed? How are we, what can we do to get that closed? Well, um, you just take a, a trip down to Joey and Fabrics and get some Velcro <laughs> and start putting skin stretchers on because we know skin stretches that that elasticity of the skin, we can use that to our, our advantage and so start stretching the skin so we can get that closed. Um, so if you're artsy, then you might want to be a surgeon. Um, most things in surgery can be fixed or at least helped. Um, so that was appealing to me. I didn't want to manage chronic diseases and stuff like that. Um, that wasn't my forte and um, that's why surgery worked better for me. Um, we get to use power tools, which is a lot of fun. Um, so this is a picture of a drill um, that we're using in surgery. And here's the drill bit down the shaft of, of the tibia, um, which is the shin bone that we're using to then place a nail due to a, a fracture. So um, power tools are fun. Um, you get to work on groundbreaking procedures and um, you're a part of a world that is developing new techniques, um, both for the benefit of, of the human race, but also we benefit from 
the discoveries that human medicine has has made and we get to use that for our own test so it's pretty cool and I'm sure there's more but um, so now we're gonna get into some different cases and just kind of talk about um, some of the interesting things that I've I've been a part of and why it, it kind of reminds me why I want to be a, a surgeon so Cash is a two-year-old male intact German short hair pointer. He was presented um, to his referring veterinarian um, for an episode of collapse one day prior to presenting to us. And he had had that collapse event about three to four hours after training out in the field. So he's a, a field bird dog. Um, his referring veterinarian ran some blood work, gave some antibiotics, some IV fluids and meloxicam, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, um, similar to aspirin in humans, but maybe especially for dogs. And then he started coughing, so that, that was concerning to the owner, who um, he was a champion field trial dog. So um, he presented to the Kansas State Veterinary Health Center um, because he had continued coughing and just wasn't quite himself. Dad knew him pretty well and just wasn't happy with how he was doing. On his physical exam, he was bright, alert, and responsive. That's what the BAR stands for. Um, his heart rate and his temperature were normal. He had previously had a fever, but that fever had resolved. And his respiratory rate was slightly increased. And he was a pretty hyper dog in general. So we were kind of wondering, is that because of something going on in his respiratory tract, or is that just because he's excited to, to be at Kansas State? Um, we did hear a soft occasional cough while he was in the clinic, and otherwise his physical exam was pretty unremarkable. So his referring vet had done a pretty nice workup with that we had discussed before. Um, so we wanted to check out what was going on in his chest cavity, and so we did some chest x-rays or thoracic radiographs. So this is a, a lateral view of a radiograph. The head is over here, the tail is back here. Um, on radiographs or x-rays, black is air density and bone is bright white. And then there are all shades of gray in between that kind of help us to determine what we're, what we're looking at. So if you look along here, this is his spine. Um, these are his ribs coming down here. This line right here is the diaphragm. This is his sternum down here. This structure in the middle is his cardiac silhouette or his heart. Um, this here is his trachea or the, the breathing tube. And then these are some of his abdominal organs that you can't really see much with, but we're focused on the chest in these x-rays. Um, and then what's abnormal on these x-rays is that you can see the margin of the lung. And so if you squint, maybe you guys can see that. Can everyone see that, that margin right there? Um, normally, you can't see that. Also normally, the heart should be sitting on the sternum. So that tells us there's something abnormal going on that's called a pneumothorax or air within the thoracic cavity, the chest cavity outside of the lungs. So normally when we breathe in, we want air to go into our lung fields and then when we breathe out, it comes out. Well, in, in Cash's case, when he was breathing in, air was leaking out, out of his lungs but still with, contained within that chest cavity. Um, so on this view, this is a normal chest. Um, so you can see the cardiac silhouette is in contact with, with the sternum. There's a little bit of fat here. So this dog was overweight, but it is in contact there. And then up here, you can't see that margin of lung. The lung margin goes all the way out to the, the very tip, the very edge. Um, so that would be what a normal x-ray would look like. So if we go back real quick, you can see again some of the abnormalities. Again, that heart is off of the, the sternum, and then you can see the margin of the lungs. Um, and then this is a picture of some of the anatomy, and so there are lots more things going on in the chest cavity that you can't see on x-ray, um, and that's just to kind of illustrate that. So 
it gives us a good starting point as to what's going on, but it's not the whole, whole story. So this is a view with, with Cash laying on his back. This one is him. This is normal. Um, and here it's a little bit harder to see the long margins, but you can kind of see them down here. Um, so they're retracted away from the chest a little bit. His heart or his cardiac silhouette is moved a little bit abnormally um, versus the normal film. So um, he was definitely abnormal. And you guys might be wondering what this little thing is. That's his microchip. So we place microchips in pets so that if they get lost, we can help find them and return them to their, their home. Um, so he had a microchip that's not a foreign body within his chest cavity. So we've diagnosed him with a pneumothorax, the air around the lungs, and there are multiple reasons why they can get that. Um, it could be a traumatic event, so if he were hit by a car or if he were stabbed with a knife or something like that. Um, but there was no history of that in his, his history talking to his owner, he had been observed the whole time, he hadn't gotten off leash and running around unobserved, so we didn't think that was what was going on. Iatrogenic means something that we've done to the patient, so if we were doing surgery within the chest cavity and we accidentally poked the lung, we could cause a pneumothorax, or if we're doing surgery in the belly and we go through the diaphragm accidentally, um, then we can cause a pneumothorax. Um, spontaneous can be for several reasons. So it can be for reasons that we don't necessarily know. We, we may never find a cause. There can be trauma or um, abnormal lungs. So you might have heard of emphysema before. Dogs can get a kind of a form of emphysema where the actual lung surface is abnormal. And so little bubbles will form on the lung surface and then will pop. And so that can cause a pneumothorax, um, or there can be infectious causes. So there were some additional diagnostics that we wanted to do for CASH. We did some infectious disease testing to rule out those potential infectious disease causes. He didn't have any evidence of infectious disease. Um, and then there's some imaging that we can do. So you can look with an ultrasound. Um, you can do a CT scan or a CAT scan. Have you guys heard of, heard of that before? Um, and then an MRI. Um, and those are all different imaging modalities to try to get more information before we go into surgery as to what's going on. Um, and then the treatment will kind of depend on what we find on those diagnostics. So um, if we didn't find anything on the diagnostics, we could try conservative therapy where we might remove that air, or we just wait and see and see how he does, since he was pretty stable. Um, we can do a, what's called a thoracocentesis, where that's what this is a picture of. So this is a cross section, so um, you're kind of looking from the front back and looking at a cross section of, of the body. This is the spine here, these are the ribs, this is musculature, these are the normal lungs. And then this black around it is the air that within the chest cavity or the pneumothorax. This is the heart here. Um, and so you stick a needle into that cavity and remove that air to try to establish negative pressure again. Um, so that was an option and that's actually what we did in Cash's case um, to see how he would do overnight. So we did that and then the morning he still had a pretty significant pneumothorax. He was um, overall pretty stable. He was similar to how he presented, but um, we didn't have a reason why he was still leaking air within that space. Um, you can put in chest tubes or thoracostomy tubes, so that would allow you to put a tube into the space and continually suction the air out, and, um, or you can go to surgery, which eventually we did in cash, but um, we'll, we're not quite there yet. So this is a video of the CT scan that we decided to do. And so again, you're looking at a cross section. This is his spine here. These are his front legs. Um, he's laying on his stomach. These are his lungs here. And this is his trachea, his breathing tube. Um, 
This is the air around his lungs. So you can kind of see that's a little bit more black than his lungs. Um, and that air is not supposed to be there. These lung margins should be all the way out to the edge of the chest cavity. So we were looking for any abnormalities of the lung tissue. We were looking for masses that potentially could have could have ruptured or something like that. Um, we didn't find any. So then we're kind of left with going to surgery. And so this is, these are drawings of the surgery that we did. We did what's called a median sternotomy, where we go in on the midline of the chest and um, make an incision there. We go through the musculature and then actually split the bones of the sternum with a saw, so we have to use a power tool, which is fun. Um, and that gives us access to both sides of the chest so we can explore and find out what's going on in him. Um, so this is a picture from surgery. It's a little bit odd because there's some glare reflection, so sorry about that, but um, this is the edge of his body wall. This is what we call a pinachetto retractor or something that helps to hold open the chest cavity so that when we're working in the chest, we don't have to have someone holding it open. And then this is actually his lung right here. And you can see this little abnormality that's a little hole in his lung. And at, the, at this point, we still didn't know what had caused it, but he's a hunting dog. And in Kansas, um, as well as other parts of the world, they have what are called migrating grass arms. And um, there are these little plants and the grass, they can breathe the grass on in and then that grass on will literally travel through the body and wreak havoc. So um, this is what we suspected in him um, because of his history of being a hunting dog. Um, we don't know why these grass on travel, but they do. And um, this is a common, common scenario for these types of dogs. Um, so we did what's called a lung lobectomy, or what we removed that lung lobe, um, and we use a stapler to do that. So um, it has multiple rows of staples, and we just staple that off and then submit it. Um, this is the lung lobe here that was removed. Um, this is a scalpel blade, which is about the size of, of my hand. Um, so just so you can see the size of the lung. And then this is collapsed a little bit. So normally an aerated lung would be a little bit bigger. Um, but think of it as a collapsed balloon a little bit. And then we cut into it to see if we could find a grass on or some type of foreign body. We didn't find one. So Cash did, did well. He spent several days in our ICU in recovery. He did great, was hard to keep confined at home. Um, he was used to being a very active dog, and so us, us telling his owner that he needed six to eight weeks of activity restriction was quite a shock and not enjoyable for him, but um, necessary for him to recover from surgery. But then two months later, the owner called and scheduled another appointment with us um, because he had a mass on his left side. And that's the side of, of his body that we took the lung lobe out of. So we were a little bit suspicious that could these be related. Um, otherwise, he was doing great at home. He came in bouncing around, no other concerns. His referring vet did do what's called a fine needle aspirate or an FNA of the mass to make sure that it wasn't a cancerous process. All that it showed was that there was some inflammatory cells. So um, just some inflammation from whatever was going on. So we decided to do an ultrasound of the mass. Um, so these are pictures from the ultrasound. The probe is up here. Um, so this is the body wall, this is some musculature. And then we could see this abnormal foreign material. So um, this is what we were expecting was likely the grass on that had punctured his lung and then continued to travel and caused a, a granuloma or a mass on, on his side. And that granuloma is basically the body's way of trying to wall off that abnormal material and get rid of it. Um, so it, it was doing its best, but hadn't quite gotten, gotten it walled off. So the body was still reacting to it. Um, so Cash went to surgery again. 
Um, so these are pictures from surgery. This is him laying on his side, and we've made an incision kind of around the mass, and here we're elevating the mass here. And again, elevating the mass up and trying to get all of that abnormal material off. Oops. And um, this is once we have it off, and it's definitely not normal happy tissue. Um, you can kind of see it, it looks a little bit dull, it looks a little bit slimy, um, that's not, not normal tissue. So um, definitely got the right thing off. And then we cut into it to look for that foreign body. And we found it. <laughs> um, so these little tiny pieces of grass or plant material caused that whole scenario where he had to have two different surgeries to, to have this removed and caused him, caused him that issue. So, um, but glad we found it and took care of him. He, um, that was after we removed it. So you can see this is nice, healthy pink tissue. Um, and now he's back to, to field trial. So he's doing well at home. The next case is Paco. He is a two-year-old millimeter Labrador retriever. He presented to us for two days of vomiting and a decreased appetite, which if you know Labradors, that's very abnormal. They will eat through anything. So um, he definitely wasn't feeling well when he came to us. On exam, he was still pretty bright, alert, and responsive. He was happy. Um, his vitals were all normal, so his heart rate, his temperature, his respiratory rate, all of those looked good. He did have some evidence of dehydration, most likely from the vomiting and, and not eating. And then when we were palpating or feeling his abdomen, he was tense, he was nauseous, he was a little bit painful. Um, and most labs, when you're, as long as you're petting them, they're, they're happy and wagging their tail. So that's definitely an abnormal finding. Um, otherwise, overall, he was unremarkable on his physical exam. His blood work showed us some history of, or some evidence of dehydration as well, and his electrolytes were a little bit off, showing us that he had been vomiting, which, which we knew from his owners. Um, so we decided to take some abdominal radiographs or X-rays of his um, of his belly. And this is what we found. So again, this is him laying on his side and heads over here, tail is back here. You can kind of see his tail there. Um, this is his spine. This is his pelvis and his femur or his thigh bone. This is his um, tibia or his shin bone. Um, you can see a little bit of his chest here and the back half of his cardiac silhouette. And then this, in his abdomen, you can see this is his spleen down here. These are his intestines through here. This is his urinary bladder. And then you see these outlines of things that, that shouldn't be there. So that was abnormal. So we're thinking Paco ate something he shouldn't have. Um, and then this is a picture or a radiograph of him on his back. And um, so his spine is here in the middle. These are his ribs. Um, and then you can kind of see up here the, the two outlines. Anyone have a a guess as to what those objects are? I'll Maybe. say a rope toy. A rope toy? Okay. Anyone else? Pacifier. Pacifier is a good guess. They like to eat those. Okay, it's a mystery. So, we have a couple of different treatment options. We can do gastroscopy, which basically we put a camera down the esophagus and into the stomach to remove foreign bodies. Um, and that's a very good option most times. Um, sometimes when you get down there, you can't grab it though. So it has to be something that you can grab decently easily and then pull back out of the esophagus. And you'd be surprised by how big of things they can fit down their esophagus. <laughs> um, it's pretty amazing. But if it fit down there, it can normally come back up. Um, or you can do an abdominal exploratory, which is surgery. So we go in through an incision into the abdomen and um, look around at everything to find out what's going on and eventually 
um, do a gastrotomy or open an incision into the, the stomach and get out whatever, whatever we're finding. So Paco, they couldn't grab it out with the scope, so he went on to surgery. Um, so this is a picture at surgery. His head is over here, his tail is back here. Um, this is a different type of retractor, so this is a Balfour retractor, and his incision is open here. This is his spleen, um, and this is his stomach here. And when we're in there, we can actually see a lot more. We can move the organs around to be able to feel them and look at them, um, make sure that there aren't any other abnormalities. Um, so this is a little bit closer picture of the stomach, and you can see the, all of the blood vessels, um, there are blood vessels on both sides, and our incision into the stomach is gonna be here where there are less blood vessels and they're not quite as big. And he had rubber duckies <laughs> in his stomach. So he had eaten these rubber duckies and then one of the technicians bought him a duck toy. <laughs> so he did great, um, he had about a two week um, recovery to let his incision heal, um, which again, keeping the lab quiet for two weeks is challenging, um, but definitely necessary for, for healing. Um, this is Buster. He's a six-year-old male neuter Maltese, and he presented to the clinic <coughs> after being attacked by a coyote. So um, he was outside um, kind of in the late evening, early early night time and his owner heard him crying and ran out there and a coyote had him. The owner chased the coyote and got the coyote to drop buster, um, but he came in in pretty bad shape. Um, so these are pictures of his wound. Um, this is on the side of his chest. Um, so he has lots of skin necrosis or dying off of the skin. Um, he had lots of abnormal unhealthy tissue um, and then these are his ribs right here. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, and then you can see holes into his chest cavity. So he also had a pneumothorax, but this is a traumatic reason. Um, and if you, so he was a Maltese, so maybe about an eight to 10 pound dog, so pretty small. And um, this is the, literally the edge of the top of his, his body and his belly is maybe down here. So he, his wound is pretty much his whole, whole side. Um, so on exam, he was depressed. He was dysmic for having trouble breathing. Um, he was in shock. He was painful. He had large wounds. So he was stabilized in our ICU. And um, then once he was stabilized, we took him to surgery to do that wound explore, clean up those tissues, and start to do treatment for, for the wounds. So this is a picture in surgery. Um, these are his, his ribs. He has some suture tied around his ribs because he had rib fractures. Um, and so the suture was helping to hold, hold those back in place. Um, the instruments are pointing at his lungs that are poking through there. And now we're thinking, how are we going to close this? There's, there's not enough tissue at this time to, to get things closed. So oh, that's another picture at surgery. So we use what's called mesh. Um, and you might have heard of this in human medicine before. They'll sometimes use it if they have a large defect in the body wall, <clears throat> excuse me, or um, sometimes for hernia repairs or something like that. Um, they'll use mesh. And so we wanted to use mesh because we were going to put what's called a wound back on him and we didn't want the wound back sticking to his lungs. <laughs> um, so the wound back is a machine that provides negative suction therapy um, and helps to develop granulation tissue, which is a blood vessel rich tissue and um, it helps to ha help wounds heal. So um, that was the point of putting the wound back on, and um, we used the mesh basically as a scaffolding to prevent it from adhering to his lungs. Um, so this is a picture of what the wound back would look like. This isn't on him, um, but you can see the little sponge in the middle, 
And then there's this tubing that is connected to a little vacuum machine that keeps negative pressure. Um, so it's a pretty neat therapy. Um, and he had that on for several days. Um, so this is him um, under anesthesia and having a, a treatment. Um, this is a thoracostomy tube or a chest tube that we talked about to help draw the air out of his chest cavity. Um, and then you can see the mesh is already being covered up by this bright pink tissue, and that's the granulation tissue. That's what we're looking at. That's what we want to happen before we close that wound. Um, that's just another picture before his wind therapy. So we did him in stages. So like I talked about before, the skin does stretch some. If you think about women when they're pregnant, um, the skin stretches slowly over time. So we can use that to our advantage when we're trying to close, close large wounds. So um, we closed his partially so that the skin would then have time to stretch some more um, and we could get the rest of this closed. So um, these are all incisions that, that we brought together, kind of stretching whatever skin we could find to, to come across and close the incision. And then we put the wound back, back, back on here for a few days. And then a few days later, we closed it the rest of the way. And then this is a little drain that we've um, put into any wounds produce fluid and stuff. And so we didn't want that tracking under our, our closed incision. So, excuse me, that's what that is. This is that incision that is right here. So you can kind of see that's already healing um, and we were able to get everything closed. So um, this is a couple of days after surgery. This is maybe a week later. So it's healing nicely. Um, and then this is when he came back to have his sutures removed. So you can see the hair is already growing back um, and he's ready, everything's healed and he's ready to have his, his sutures removed. And that's a picture of him. He did great. Um, he, owners were, were thrilled with how he did and he was, he was a feisty little guy, so I'm um, happy that he did well. Um, this is Bacon <laughs> Bit. Um, he is an eight-year-old malnutrited Vietnamese potbelly pig. He presented, he was literally their, their house pet. Um, he was um, a part of their family. He slept in their bed. He slept on the couch. He um, was inside at all times, so he he came to the small animal clinic. It wasn't enough for him to, to go out in the field. Um, he presented for weakness in his hind legs or his pelvic limbs, and he was unable to get on and off the couch as much as he had been before, and he had back pain. Um, so they found that he was crying out more than normal. He seemed grumpy with them, which was abnormal for him, um, and just wasn't feeling his best. Um, so when he came to us, he was what we call non-ambulatory paraparetic, which basically means he was paralyzed. He wasn't able to walk in his hind legs. Um, and when we palpated or felt along his spine, he actually showed us that he had some pain there. Um, his blood work looked good. And so if you can imagine when you're trying to think how, how are we gonna image the spine of this pig, um, to get more information. There are options we could do x-rays or the radiographs that we've done. It's gonna give you information about the bone, but not much else. We could do a CT scan or a CAT scan, or we could do an MRI. Well, he wouldn't fit in our MRI machine, um, so he got a CT scan. Um, this is me doing a physical exam on him. I'm doing an orthopedic exam. Um, and stuff before he, he was induced. This, these are pictures from his CT. I'm sorry, I don't have the whole thing, but um, so this is a cross section looking basically front to back. This is his vertebrae, so the kind of the points you can feel on the back of your neck, those are your dorsal spinous processes. Um, that's what this is here. This is his spinal cord here. And then all of this is abnormal, and this is abnormal. Um, so this should be 
this side should look like this side, and you can see this big black mark that's abnormal. On this view, this is looking at him from the side, and the, that looks really bad, sorry. Um, these are the dorsal spinous processes, so they're quite large in a pig. Um, this white line, or kind of grayish line, is his spinal cord. These bright white things are the intervertebral discs, so in between each of your vertebrae you have a disc um, that is kind of a shock absorber. So you've heard people that have had disc issues and back pain, um, that's usually the culprit of that. And then you can see kind of right here, this is abnormal. So this is pushing his spinal cord up and out of the way, and there's not much room in the spinal canal um, for the spinal cord. It basically houses the spinal cord in a little bit of fluid. So anything abnormal in there is gonna cause pain, gonna cause neurologic deficits. So, bacon bit went to surgery. Um, for what's called a decompressive hemilaminectomy, and we also wanted to get a biopsy of that abnormal tissue. Um, so basically, decompressive hemilaminectomy is a fancy term for a cut in the bone, um, and the laminectomy is just the part of the bone that we're cutting into, so we're making a little window in the bone so that the spinal cord basically has room again, and we're taking a biopsy of that abnormal tissue. Unfortunately, his diagnosis was lymphoma, which is a type of cancer, um, so bacon bit was euthanized, um, but the owners were very happy that they had an answer and um, had a reason to euthanize him because he was in pain and they didn't want him suffering anymore. Next is Jax. He is a three-year-old male-neutered greyhound. He lived on a farm and was running around um, like a wild maniac, and he was hit by a motorcycle because he crossed a road he shouldn't have. And when he came to us, he was non-weight-bearing on the right hind leg or the pelvic limb. Um, when we felt that leg, there was crepitus, kind of that crunchy feeling. Um, if any of you have broken bones, that's what it felt like. <laughs> um, and instability of the femur or the thigh bone. Um, there was lots of swelling in his thigh and bruising of the thigh. So he was stabilized because we were worried about his other, other systems after being hit by a motorcycle, um, but overall he was pretty stable other than his, his fracture. So then he had some diagnostics, so we took some x-rays. Um, this is him laying on his back, so this is his spine here. You can see his long feel. Um, in between there. This is his pelvis. This is what his femur should look like. Um, this is his hip joint. Um, this is his kneecap or his patella. This is his knee joint. Um, and then this was his fractured leg. So um, you can see the soft tissue swelling. Um, his leg should is very muscular but um, should look more like this side and it it was definitely larger, um, and you can see that there are broken bones in lots of pieces. So whenever we have a, whenever we're presented with a broken bone, we want to think about how we're going to fix that. How are we going to put that back together? So we classify fractures to help us to do that. And there are multiple ways to do the classification. Um, cause, if it's a traumatic event, like in Jax's case or pathologic, if it was a bone tumor or something like that, that weakens the bone and that, that can cause a fracture. Um, the type of fracture, so basically how it, how it kind of looks or how it's broken is what, is what we call a comminuted fracture, so multiple different pieces, um, but there are different, different types, so segmented, oblique kind of means um, at an angle, um, transverse is straight across, um, open versus closed. So if there's a, a wound associated with the fracture or not, that's gonna change how we're gonna treat it. And then how it's displaced, because we need to think about how we're gonna get it back together. And then we also need to think about the different factors that come along with that fracture um, that are gonna weigh into how we repair it. So there are fracture factor, 
factors um, because we're trying to reconstruct the bony column. Um, our implants are going to have to share share the load or sometimes take the full load if there's not a bony column to reconstruct. Um, the demands of the implant are going to depend on what other injuries. So sometimes they come in with two broken legs or sometimes three broken legs and you know we're going to have to rely a lot more on our implant then than if they just have one broken leg. Um, what type of soft tissue damage is around there? Um, are there open wounds that we have to manage? That type of thing. And then our patient factors, you know, a young silly Labrador is going to be different than an older, more relaxed type of dog. Um, also, moving a big greyhound or helping a big greyhound to move is going to be a lot different than um, a little Maltese that you could potentially pick up and carry. The metabolic state is basically how the patient is doing otherwise. So what other kinds of things are going on? Is it a nice, healthy, young patient or is it an older, sick patient that has liver disease and kidney disease? Um, and then client factors. So are our clients gonna be compliant with what we're asking them to do? So when we say that they have to be activity restricted for eight weeks and they're not allowed to jump on and off the couch, are they gonna follow those directions? Um, the cost is always a factor. These are expensive implants. They're the same or similar implants that they would use in human medicine, and we don't get a discount just because we're working on, on animals, so they can be very costly procedures. Um, what additional care are they going to require? Are they going to require physical therapy afterwards or the other wound management, that type of thing? And rehabilitation it goes along with the physical therapy. Um, so, where um, is video grabs? We um, might be at the end of the presentation, sorry. So he had a fracture repair um, where we put a bone plate and screws and also an iron pin, which I will find at the end of the presentation. Sorry about that. Um, Misha. Or Mishka, sorry, is another dog. She is a four-month-old female intact husky. She also presented after being hit by a car, and she had this large wound on her on her paw, on her back paw. Um, she also had crepitus and instability of the tibia or the shin bone. Um, so she had not only a fracture but then an open wound to deal with. Um, so we took some X-rays of her. Um, you can see it. These lines here, does anyone know it? Are those fractures? Or does anyone know what those are? She's a young puppy. Those are actually her growth plates. So that's where her bone grows from. Um, so if we took x rays of most of you in this room, you would have open biceps or open growth plates still because you're growing. Um, once you're an adult, if we go back to Jax's films, you can see, I know they're different bones, but he doesn't have the growth plate here, he doesn't have the growth plate here, or the kind of the jaggedy one at the bottom of his, of his femur, so um, those definitely look different than Mishka's. And that's because she's a young growing puppy. Um, the outline of this is a splint that's on, so that's not part of her normal anatomy. And then the fracture that she had is right here. Um, you can see some air within the tissues down here, and that's from where the wound is on her paw. Um, and then this is another view of the fracture, and the fracture kind of goes along here. It's what we call a spiral fracture. So we kind of use tinker toys. This is what's called an external fixator, external skeletal fixator. And whenever we have an open fracture, we ideally don't want to have put an implant in that's going to stay in there forever. So what's nice about the external skeletal fixators is that we can remove it after the bone is healed. Um, they look like Frankenstein for a while because they have all of this metal coming off of them. Um, but it's a really nice way to 
close not only a potentially contaminated wound or fracture, but also she's a young growing puppy and we don't want to disturb those growth plates. So if we put a plate across her tibia and went into one of these growth plates, we could potentially affect her healing um, or her growing in the future. And so we don't want to affect that. So that's why an external skeletal fixator was chosen for her. And we use what's called fluoroscopy. So this is real time x-ray in surgery. So we're scrubbed in and then we have what's called a C-arm where we're able to take pictures or radiographs, x-rays, while we're in surgery so we can make sure that our fracture is well aligned and that when we're putting our pins and implants on, we're not through any of the important structures like the growth plate or um, the fracture. We don't wanna go through the fracture that takes the pain. So this is her after her fracture repair. So she has um, a, what's called a hybrid fixator on, so a ring at the bottom and then um, pins across the top. Um, and then all of that metal is on the outside of, of her body. So um, basically the only, the only incisions that we're treating are right here at the skin edge, and they're just the size of the pins that are coming out. But we can't forget she also has this wound on her paw. Um, so this is the skeletal fixer wrapped up here and then we're treating her paw, and we actually use honey. Has anyone heard of using honey to treat wounds before? So it's actually great to treat wounds. Um, it produces the right amount of oxygen tension for wound healing. It's antibacterial in nature, um, so it's, it's great for us, and it helps to develop that granulation tissue that we talked about earlier that we want for wound healing. So this is kind of a progression of her wounds. Um, so you can already see her foot's a lot less swollen. It's improving. Um, the wound is looking a little bit healthier every single day. Um, this is a, a view from the top. Um, and we kind of got worried about this, um, this toe right here. Um, so we actually ended up doing a toe amputation so not only could we use this tissue, this skin, um, to close the part of the wound, but we were worried about the viability of this toe. And she doesn't need all of her toes to walk, she, she'll be just, just fine. So um, we did a toe amputation, and then we were left with this smaller wound to deal with, um, and she still has her external fixator on up here. This is a few days later, so you can see the wound is already retracting, um, getting smaller, and um, looking very healthy every time we're changing the bandage. And then this is her several weeks later. This is when she came back to have her fixator removed. I think she came back at about four or five weeks, and the wound is completely healed. She already has her husky hair growing, um, growing back, and that's a picture of, of her face. Um, and I think that's all. Does anyone have any questions right now? Thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate it. I'm gonna check and make sure Blue Valley doesn't have any questions. So we go up to that shared screen. Anyone do the more? <laughs> no. no questions from us. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> So I have a question. Sure. Um, so uh, as far as preparing for veterinary school, what did you do for uh, getting, you know, experience and, um, you know, letters of recommendation from people that you, that you worked with to help your chances, I guess, of getting into that school? Yeah. So what was your experience? Um, I'm from Ohio. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. And in high school, I babysat. Um, I worked as a lifeguard and eventually made the, the way up to a manager position at my lifeguarding job. And then I worked with an equine or a horse vet. And um, that's really what kind of got me excited about veterinary medicine and made me realize that that's what I wanted to do. So um, 
through him, through that veterinarian. I worked with him every day as a veterinary assistant. And so that was once I was 15 or 16 um, and got the experience of riding along. He, he was an ambulatory vet, so he rode out in a truck and went to different farms to see horses and see his cases. And so I rode along, helped hold horses, helped draw drugs, helped um, administer medications um, when he was doing a lameness exam. So trying to find out why a horse was limping, I would be the one that ran the horse up and down the, the walkway, um, carting stuff in and out of the truck, that type of thing. And then through him, I met a small animal veterinarian um, that I also shadowed and was a veterinary assistant there. So um, helped, you know, get people into the, the room. So if you guys have ever taken your dog to the vet, there's someone that kind of shows you to a room, um, that type of thing, and just anything they needed around the clinic, cleaning, that type of thing. Um, and so my letters of recommendation, um, and then I continued to work with them through the summers in college. So when I was in college, I would come home for the summer, I went to Ohio State, and um, I would continue to work with them. And then when I was in college, I had another job. I worked as a lab animal resource technician. So the lab animals at the vet school, um, they have technicians there that make sure they're healthy, do weight checks on them, do general husbandry here, um, making sure they have water, food, making sure they're not sick or anything like that. Um, so that was my role there. And so I had three veterinarians and then my boss who was above me as a life party manager um, that wrote letters of recommendation to get me into school. Um, I think Ohio State required 100 or so hours of veterinary related experience. Each school is gonna be a little bit different on what their requirements are, um, but all of their websites should discuss what, what exactly you need to do kind of before school. But anything, um, that you can do to have leadership experience or communication experience or um, you know any if you can find a vet in your area that will let you come in and shadow them for a day um, and build a relationship with them is really important. Um, in high school I took a public speaking class still not very good <laughs> I don't enjoy it but um, <laughs> it's definitely something that's important and um, communication is so important in our field, so I would recommend that. And um, I did a lot of volunteer work as well because that was important to me. So kind of they want to know that in vet school they want you to be a well-rounded person, but interested in in veterinary experience. So it's um, does that answer your question? <laughs> Just to give. You know a little bit more personal idea of what, yeah. what expectations are. Yeah. Um, as a surgeon, do you work primarily with like small breeds or do you work with like all sizes? So I don't know if you guys can hear over there, but her question was um, as a surgeon, do I work with small breeds or all different sizes? So in vet school, you are taught about all of the different size animals um, and anything from exotic animals to your normal dogs and cats. And then after vet school is when you can more specialize. And then surgery, they have a large animal surgeon and a small animal surgeon. Um, so I'm a small animal surgeon. So mostly dogs and cats every once in a while we, we see exotics and stuff like that. So when, you, when you're in vet school, how do you go from, you know, entering vet school all the way into a residency program? How do you get introduced to doing surgeries once you're in the vet school program? Like, do you start doing surgeries from day one? Or <laughs> what's the kind of the stepwise process in, in getting to a point where you're actually doing surgery? Yeah, so um, in vet school, they have a curriculum and each school is gonna have a little bit different curriculum. At Ohio State, the first two years, Basically, you're in the classroom, and any other work you're trying to 
get outside experience. So um, they offer all different types of things. I know Kansas State does too, um, where you can go on trips to do spays and neuters and um, poverty countries, you can go on um, trips to see how veterinarians work in other countries, that type of thing. Um, but your first live surgery in most programs is during your third year. And um, leading up to that, you have labs and classrooms where you're practicing on models or um, they have these little suture boards that you're practicing learning kind of the techniques of surgery. And then um, the fourth or third year students are the ones that get their first experience with, with live dogs. Um, we do do some cadaver procedures as well during third year um, <clears throat> and potentially even sooner now they're trying to introduce kind of the hands-on stuff a little bit sooner now with clinical skills labs and stuff, which is great. Um, fourth year, you're in clinic, so you're, unless you're on the shelter rotation, when you come onto the surgery rotation, you're not doing much surgery. You'll get to do a spay or a neuter um, for a couple of weeks on that rotation, but we're seeing kind of these um, more complicated cases, so you're assisting the surgeons, but um, still learning the techniques of surgery. And then they have all different types of opportunities that you can get involved in kind of do outside of the actual curriculum um, to be able to do surgery maybe a little bit sooner. Awesome. Any other questions?